Well, here I am with uh, a friend, a colleague, and um, a doctor who I have great interest and great admiration because she is of the cutting edge sect. She is approaching psychiatry in a whole new way. What do you call, this is Dr. Kelly Brogan, what do you call your form of psychiatry? So the phrase that I've used is holistic women's health psychiatry. Right. But it really raises more eyebrows than it answers questions because no right. one's ever heard of what this means. So right. a term I like is, you know, root cause resolution because I like to, to get to the get to the point that conventional medicine really isn't asking the question why when we're talking about any of these chronic illnesses. And that's really what I do every day with patients is just dig deep on that question. Why? Why why is it that they are experiencing the symptoms that they have? Well, one of the things, you've written an incredible book. I sat down and started to read it and read it cover to cover in a couple of days. It was really interesting. It's called A Mind of, Her, of Your Own, right? That's right. Mind of Your Own. I don't have it right in front of me. I should. And what I loved was in the opening you said, psychiatry has become the dumping ground from all the other doctors and specialties who can't figure it out, so they send them to us, and then we're expected to put our patients on antidepressants. You want to fill me in there? Right, right. So people are getting sick, as you well know, um, in more and more complicated ways. And unfortunately, because there's such a lag, it's an, it's been documented to be up to 17 years between the published scientific literature and what's actually done in clinical practice. Doctors are ill-prepared today to meet the complexity of the average patient who comes in with, you know, symptoms of brain fog and bloating and rashes here and there and hair loss and a feeling of hopelessness. You know, we, they don't know how to screen diagnostically for what type of autoimmune or inflammatory disorder that might be. And they really don't have the time to dig deep into the history of, of the presenting illness. So what happens is that, you know, Doctors are not bad people. They want to help their patients. And, and the tool that is made available to them by conventional training for the distress that a patient experiences around these complex illnesses is antidepressants, right? So you have a five minute visit with your internist, you talk about all this laundry list of problems that you have. Sort of the best that he or she can do is hand over a, a Prozac prescription, right? And it would be all well and good if these medications were safe and effective. Um, I think we really, really wish they were. <laughs> like we're really attached to the idea that they are. But the, the truth, unfortunately, is, is very far from that. Um, and, and the safety factor and the risks that are documented and how difficult, if not impossible, it is at this stage to predict who might suffer uh, you know, adverse effects from any of these medications, even within hours of the first dose. Because we don't have the tools, you know, it, it can be considered really careless uh, to be overprescribing the way that we are. Don't you feel, with the um, present environment of toxicity, that that's at the base of what's going wrong with people's health and ultimately people's brains? Because I've read stats anywhere from 29% and up of high school students in this country who are on prescribed amphetamines. And I was talking to someone recently who had a child on um, amphetamines and he was frustrated. He said, the kids are now romanticizing their, as I call them, the initials. Oh, I have ADD. Oh, right. really? Well, I have ADD and OCD. Well, I have ADHD. Right. And what I like about what you are doing is um, discovering the underlying deficiencies in the body or the gut uh, uh, imbalances that are creating hormonal imbalances. And I'd like you to talk about that because this is a new way to approach ADD. I don't think that we can continue on the path that we are with mm -hmm. our children mm -hmm. on prescribed amphetamines with brains that are not fully formed yet. And this applies to the adult uh, population also, but let's just talk about the kids right now. Absolutely. I mean, a study literally hot off the press just on my desk, uh, longitudinal studies showing that there was no benefit whatsoever 
uh, from prescription of amphetamines to children with ADHD over the long term. So we know that for FDA approval, the average study is, you know, six to eight weeks maybe. So, you know, patients enter the psychiatric mill and there are very few doctors who take the time to consider discontinuation of medication. Uh, so it ends up often being a long-term commitment. And, and you're touching on something really critical, which is what, what is going on here, right? So, so, so two things are going on. People are sicker and they are also being diagnosed more frequently. Uh, so the, the sickness comes from, you know, what you have worked to expose, particularly in your most recent book, Toxic, is, is that we are swimming in a, in a sea of 100,000 largely unstudied chemicals that we are not engaging a, a native lifestyle, you know, sunlight, sleep rhythms, the type of stress that we're exposed to. We're no longer eating food, you know, and when we're eating food, we're eating chemicals. So we have to remember that you know, we evolved over 2.5 million years uh, to expect, our, for our genes to expect a certain palette of exposures. And we've um, really left the path so dramatically in the past 100, 150 years that our bodies are responding. And this is called in the literature evolutionary mismatch, right? And so what is borne out in, in the medical literature is that depression is really almost like a syndrome for what the body is trying to do to respond to that to those stressors and you know when they study it in animal models it's called sickness syndrome because it's really like you know the fatigue the avoiding uh, human contact the loss of libido sometimes changes in appetite all of these symptoms are really they have a purpose you know the body doesn't make mistakes it's just that the onslaught of this type of stress is unending, you know, so it's, it's, it's chronic, it becomes chronic. And so in this way, you know, what I, the literature that I explore is really just putting depression in the same category as all of the other modern chronic diseases, right? Heart disease, diabetes, autoimmunity, cancer, um, in that it is most easily uh, described as an inflammatory and immune dysregulation. So, in the literature on this model of depression, they use, um, to induce the symptoms in animals, they use something called lipopolysaccharide, right? So LPS, and it's actually um, a bacterial wall component. And so what that means is that simply exposing the system and the immune system to a certain type of bacteria, um, bacterial component that doesn't belong there can stimulate such a storm of inflammation that it begins to look like what we're calling depression. So what that tells us is that the gut and what's going on with the gut and the integrity of the lining of the gut is really critical um, to, to what we're seeing and calling a certain type of depression. And we also know that this is true because if you cut the nerve between the gut and the brain, one of them called the vagus nerve, you know, then this reaction doesn't happen in these animals. So the communication now from the gut up to the brain is, is a big focus on a, a branch of research called psychoneuroimmunology that is intending to advance psychiatry beyond the, the brain chemical imbalance story, which we're really learning is, is, is a myth. So... When you talk about sort of taking um, a medication, particularly at a young age, I mean, there's almost nothing that inspires more rage in me um, and pain, really, than what's happening to our youth. You know, there's like 11% of children ages 3 to 7 on psychiatric medications. Right. And... I think it's because parents don't know that there are other options and they, they feel desperate and they want a quick fix. And, and they are at their wit's end. Right. It's very, very difficult on the entire family when you have an ADHD in particular uh, child because of the episodes of rage. And then on the other spectrum, the ADD, attention deficit mm -hmm. um, deficiency, they um, have such depression and it sets the whole family into... A turmoil. You and I have had, sadly had, a dear mutual friend and I interviewed Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez in so many of my books and you 
the reason I uh, you have such appeal to me is because he chose you to mentor, mm -hmm. and I'd never known him to do anything like that. And I know both of you and I still mourn his loss, and probably always will. One of the things he told me in my last interview with him in Toxic was that they are seeing evidence of solid tumors 10 and 15 years down the line on children on prescribed amphetamines of the prostate, breast, uh, bladder, and I think the other was liver. I'd have to look it up, but whatever. Whatever four they were, they're pretty bad. If parents knew in advance, okay, I'm going to, it's like the television commercials, you know, you take this pill, but you may get cancer, you may get heart disease, you know, dizzy, uh, vision loss, et cetera, et cetera, but it'll take away your gas. Right. If, parents, <laughs> exactly. if parents were to know in front, okay, I know it's difficult to have a child with one of these um, initial uh, diseases, conditions. I call it condition. It is a condition. Right. Um, but, uh, so we have this pill that will allow for clarity and focus and amphetamine. But the brain isn't fully formed, so down the road, probably going to have brain issues and uh, very likely could have cancer of one of the um, uh, organs or glands of the body. Still want it? I think if it were presented like that, I think any thinking parent would go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, what else could we do? At that point, what would you tell them what else could they do? Mm. I love this question because what you're speaking to is my greatest passion, which is informed consent. It's all I'm asking for, if I'm asking for anything, is for us to have a fuller picture, for every patient to have a fuller picture of at least all of the evidence that's out there. And much of it is unfortunately rather incriminating, particularly of long-term exposure to really all psychiatric medications. Um, and, and including in the realm of cancer, believe it or not. So, so it's really all classes. So we want to ask two questions when we look at informed consent. We want to ask what are the benefits and we want to ask what are the risks. The, right. mo the most important question to me and the one I'll get to is what are the alternatives? So those are the three components of any informed consent. But let's just focus on the first two because when we look at the benefits, we want to see better outcomes with treatment right? So the person who really blew the lid off of this question is uh, Robert Whitaker. He's an investigative journalist. He wrote a book that changed my life called Anatomy of an Epidemic. And he essentially put all of this research I had never heard of in a decade of training into one book that decimates any claim that any category of psychiatric medications actually results in better functional outcomes in the long term. Mm. So that's the benefits question. Uh, and then we have to look at the risks. And so you're touching on some of the emerging science that really incriminates these medications because you can't, I like to talk about, you know, a spider web. We think in conventional medicine, you can just pull one little thread, right? And leave the spider web alone. But of course, that's not what ha what's happening. I mean, when you take a pharmaceutical product, the reason that there are often 75 plus potential side effects is because you're moving the whole web. You're impacting the body in totally unpredictable ways. So when we think about you know, the physician's oath, right? First, do no harm. It seems to forefront what we're now calling alternatives, marginalizing and dismissing as alternatives. Because if there is an intervention that even has scientific evidence behind it, um, that is completely benign, risk-free even, and has the potential for a high yield outcome, shouldn't that be where we're starting? So for example, you know, when it comes to uh, prescription of stimulants, a lot of the, the uh, questions that I would ask as a parent first, before we even talk about the bigger picture, you know, socio-political, cultural questions about what we're asking our children to do, including sit in a seat for eight hours a day with their hands folded in their laps when they're not constructed to do that, you know, when we leave it, even leaving that very important conversation aside, there is evidence for many, many considerations, including um, the antigenic properties, so the, the um, inflammatory properties of foods like wheat. Um, the potential for iron deficiency is a big one. There is evidence for using specific nutrients in the B vitamin family. So there are, are physiologic. Um, reasons often that children are 
expressing these types of symptoms. One of the most obvious ones is that we are, you know, sort of drugging our children through, through their diets, right? So we're feeding them chemicals, preservative dyes, sugar, and we're wondering why it is that they feel, you know, that they are out of their own control, right? Because right. that's really when it becomes distressing for the child, too, is when they themselves feel out of their own control. So the, the truth is that there are um, simple, safe options, but if they're not presented to you, you'll never know that they're legitimate. But how many kids are getting the proper food? How many kids are getting um, organic food? Even, even, even children in my family who uh, have grown up in a, a household where it is organic, where they do green their house, what are they picking up at school? What are the chemicals they're cleaning the schools with? If you're already toxic from um, a, a gut that was born uh, with imbalance, which pretty much all the kids are born like That's that today, right. um, they're, they're like the canaries in the coal mine. You expose them to some toxic chemical cleaner at school and it's going to have an effect on, on their uh, ADD or the OCD or ADHD. That's so, right. do you do that kind of with your patients? Do you go back and do that kind of of genetic uh, association with what this person should be eating because of their ancestry? Yes. And, and so, how do you do that? yes, yes. So it's actually much simpler than it than it sounds, and I'll explain it. Um, but the the concept that you're speaking to is, you know, in functional medicine, we we use the uh, metaphor of like a bucket, right? So everyone walks around as this bucket and there are little drops, you know, that are falling into the bucket all the time, whether it's, you know, the, the cleaning, the Clorox on the table you just touched, whether it's the pesticides you're eating, whether it's the stress you're under, all of these, you know, toxicant and um, stressor exposures add up. And so often it can just be one thing that tips you over the edge and that's when you become sick. But it's right. not like you're well, 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 well sick, right? right? right. It's a cumulative process, and that's what we, we call it—the tipping point. And exactly. we're saying the same thing: a glass full of water, one more drop, exactly. and it overflows, and then it triggers every allergy you didn't know you had. Exactly. And you become that canary in the coal mine. And the beauty is, you know, that I see adult uh, women in my practice, and the beauty is they've been trashing their bodies just the way I did, you know, for decades. And amazingly, within the space of one to three months they can turn the whole ship around. It's almost like we shouldn't be offered that gift, you know, of, of such resiliency. I find it incredible to this day. But so the, so the way that I um, assess for diet, you know, compatibility in my practice is different, obviously, than, than the way that Nick did. Um, there's specific uh, blood work that you can do that helps you to see whether you're someone who runs a bit more acid or alkaline but really it's almost, you know, from what he taught me, um, like a character assessment uh, because there are certain traits, and I'll describe those that are most common in my practice, that are an indication that this type of, you know, red meat inclusive, more sort of paleo-ish type diet is your ticket home, right? And so some of these traits are that you're somebody who's prone to depression, that you're somebody who's prone to weight gain, that you're a night person rather than a morning person, that you're somebody who's often hungry all the time, like you have reactive hypoglycemia. And there are explanations for why all of this is on an autonomic nervous system level. Um, these people are often, you know, sort of free thinkers, more creative types rather than sort of, you know, rigid doctor, surgeon, lawyer types. Um, and they are, they're prone to certain types of illnesses, from autoimmunity to liquid tumors. And the, the antidote for them is an acidic diet that includes, you know, pork, beef, lamb, for example, starchy vegetables, you know, if any fruit, actually tropical fruit, um, but fruit is really largely minimized. And, and of course, then cruciferous vegetables and, and all the rest of the, the vegetable category. But what I find amazing is that when I discuss with patients that it, it may be the best intervention for them to include pastured red meat in their diet, often they'll look at me like I just, you know, told them they won the lottery, right? Because they've been told for so many years that this is dangerous for them and they can't, you know, it's carcinogenic and everything else. Um, and believe me, when it comes to industrial animals, that's extremely true. You know, that's, I, would, I would rather a patient never touch an industrial 
meet, right. um, you know, their whole lives. So, so if I have a patient who I recommend that to, and they say, ooh, I can almost see them like gagging internally, I need to listen to that. Because what I'm really looking to cultivate is something that we've lost, which is this inner sense for what we need to eat. Nick always said, I get my patients eating what they want to eat. <laughs> Right. right. So right. it's like we've lost that compass because we have all these gurus speaking in our head and we've read too many books and, you know, we, we or are scared. We're running scared from our own intuition. Uh, but that's a lot of what, you know, I, I look to do for people is just get them back in touch with their own doctor, their own inner guru, you know, because it's all in there. Right. Nick um, Gonzalez, Dr. Nick Gonzalez had a very unique cancer protocol. And now that he is no longer with us, uh, you and I were both at his funeral, and we saw that that church was packed mm -hmm. with cancer patients, all of whom were well. So what you and I both were so upset about that day is, who will carry on? He taught you a lot. I almost believe as I'm talking to you that he must have had some intuition that he wasn't going to be here. Mm. That he spent so because he was so busy with patients mm -hmm. and so many of his patients he never even charged. I believe he was such a a gift from God. Mm. He taught you so much. Do you think you're going to be able to carry on the work of Nick Gonzalez at least to some degree? Sounds like you have adopted a lot of of yes. his thinking. I'm glad I'm glad you're asking this because it's a question. Um, on a lot of people's minds, I think, right. and and it's true. You know, I just spoke um, on a panel at South by Southwest, and I had a couple come up to me afterward with tears in their eyes, you know, and talking about how he, you know, he not only wouldn't be alive if it weren't for Nick Gonzalez, but that he is healthier than he ever was before his right. cancer diagnosis. Twenty, I think it was twenty-four years ago. So these, you know, these people are walking the earth, and they are the greatest living, uh, you know, testament to his brilliance. Um, I did learn a lot from him. I'm a quick learner. I've never been uh, more activated, you know, from my heart to my mind to everything else than being in his presence. And, you know, my even sharing this space with you is, is an honor because of how much I, I knew he saw that you got it you know, and, and how rare it was in his experience for, for a, good, a good person to be on the right side of the truth. It was just his experience. He was very um, isolated. So right. I, I know that there was something important in my contact with him, but I think, and we discussed this, I think actually that the next person is going to come potentially through me and my work. You know, because I have a big mouth, I'm out there, you know, talking about it. I don't think I'll ever give a presentation again in my life without, um, you know, bowing down to what he ha has offered to the history of medicine. And so I know that there will be someone who learns of it um, that I can help, you know, mm -hmm. initiate uh, into his, his protocol. Because I do use, it is greatly informed um, what I do with patients. And, you know, he's all over the book as well and, and his influence on right. me. Um, but I, I believe that the, you know, sort of the, the, the torch should be passed to someone who is um, ready, qualified, and, and willing to focus on cancer alone. It's so needed. It's so necessary. Um, and certainly, you know, his, his associate, you know, Dr. Linda Isaacs is still practicing. Right. Right. Thank goodness. I see, though, a great correlation between um, your breakthroughs in psychiatry, which to me is a real breakthrough, that maybe there's another way. Maybe in a psychiatry, maybe depression doesn't have to be treated with an antidepressant. Maybe uh, brain conditions don't have to be treated with amphetamines. And I think uh, the small role I play over here is breaking down what Nick said and other incredible mm -hmm. doctors such as yourself, I can break it down into lay speak. Mm -hmm. If people could just understand that every choice uh, matters, everything they put on their skin, yes. everything they consume, every, every 
bit of air that they breathe is going to matter. And I always ask of my readers to, at the end of the day, make an imaginary list. If the present paradigm of, of health is uh, ending up uh, decrepit, frail, uh, with cancer, Alzheimer's, or, or major heart disease, or all of the above in a nursing that. home, exactly. if that's not a, a, something that you envision for yourself, right. then, then what did you do today to move yourself away from that paradigm? And at the end of the day, I think people will be so surprised to see how many choices they make throughout the day towards yes. that awful end that we're watching around us. So knowing that, um, you know, you know that study, the Environmental Working Group, that they tested the cord yes. blood of newborns across the, the economic spectrum. And that these are babies, they haven't had even a sip of breast milk That's yet. Right. This is just cord, cord blood. They tested for 287 different toxins. All of the babies tested positive for a minimum of 180 toxins. So that means our babies are no longer born clean. And they're no longer born in, in they're uh, uh, nurtured in clean wombs because the mother's womb is no longer clean. It's no longer balanced because doctors are not understanding. You've got to prepare a womb today, whereas it used to be just a given, a woman gets pregnant, no problem. Now she needs probiotics, she needs that whole GI tract healed up so that her immune system is solid and, and, and it means changing a diet, I would say, for almost Always. a year before you get pregnant. Mm -hmm. But when I, when I hear you talk about diet as essential in psychiatry, this is new. It sounds so simple, but up till now doctors, to my knowledge, you can confirm this or not, are never taught much about nutrition. Yeah, it, 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 if anything, I think I had about an hour uh, in eight years of, nine years actually, of, of, yeah. of training. And we do, you know, in the emergency room setting, there is some awareness that, you know, we should screen, for example, maybe for B12 levels. Um, but it's very, very sort of dismissed and diminished. And certainly when you get to the outpatient setting, it's totally forgotten. I mean, there are many, 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 if not most psychiatrists who don't even run basic blood work um, to screen for, for gross deficiencies in their, in their patients. I mean, one of my favorite case studies of all time uh, that really, you know, spoke a truth to me about the relevance of diet is about this woman who was, you know, postmenopausal and she'd been a vegetarian for 27 years. And she developed depression, actually what's called psychotic depression, which meant that she was hearing voices and delusional and paranoid. By the time she was hospitalized, she was considered catatonic, which in psychiatry is pretty much as bad as it gets. It's what it sounds like. She was treated with antipsychotic medications and antidepressants. She was actually given electroconvulsive therapy, which we still do in this country. And she got no better. So they sent her to an outside hospital because, you know, they sort of threw their hands up. They sent her to another hospital. At this other hospital, they actually bothered to screen for a B12 blood level. And she was below the range, not even very dramatically, but below the range, which, of course, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of your listeners know is, is often one of the sequelae of, of a vegetarian diet because it's a primarily uh, animal-based um, nutrient, right? So they injected her with B12. Two injections later, not only were all of her presenting symptoms resolved, but 14 years of symptoms. This is two injections only of B12. 14 years of symptoms she had just sort of tolerated, malaise, fatigue, she had thought were sort of part of her personality, cleared up. So if that doesn't make you at least curious about right. what we are calling psychiatric that really is physio physiologic and that is resolvable and reversible through nutrition, you know, right. then you're not paying attention to the literature. That's really what it comes so, to. So it's determining your nutritional and, and mineral deficiencies um, rather than the uh, dopamine theory yeah. that um, it's a lack of dopamine in the brain that's causing all the problems. How did that happen? Yeah. So, so we are taught by pharmaceutical companies in this country, right? We're one of two co countries on the planet that allow for direct-to-consumer advertising, you know, so that pharmaceutical companies beholden to their, you know, stockholders are speaking directly to patients about their health. 
there is a very insidious effect of this, you know, because there's messaging that is embedded, you know, in every exposure. You can't spend a day in America without being exposed to this messaging. So we're, we're taught, you know, about depression, for example, being uh, a brain chemical imbalance and sometimes specifically talked talk to about it's being a serotonin deficiency or a serotonin imbalance and that the chemicals and antidepressants are going to fix it right up. And unfortunately, you know, if you really dig into the literature, 60 years have not substantiated that theory. You know, right. it's, it's really a theory and believe me, they have been working hard to, to try and drum up some evidence for it. You know, to the extent that now, even in the conventional realms of psychiatry, there's some admission that we sort of need a new theory. You know, what's called the monoamine theory is, is sort of, you know, bankrupt. And so what I find really important to then clarify is that if we're going to accept that these medications are not fixing anything, then what are they doing, right? If you like what they're doing, I mean, every time I lecture, there's somebody who stands up in the audience and says, I don't care what you have to say, Prozac has saved my life or, you know, saved my friend's life. And, you know, I'm happy for you. I'm happy that you found, you know, the type of health care that works for you. But what it's really doing is it's having a chemical effect in the same way, really not in a different way than if you were like an, a socially anxious person and you had two shots of vodka before you went to a party yeah. and you felt a bit calmer. That's a chemical effect you might like. It might actually work for you. But don't be confused into thinking that it's a cure because you, know, that you don't have an alcohol deficiency if you're that person, right? And you could see the potential dangers of long-term exposure to this type of you know chemical adaptation which essentially the body is forced to do and that's what really made me put down my prescription pad because I started taking patients off of antidepressants and other medications after I read that book that I mentioned to you and what I saw about psychiatric medication withdrawal in my own practice made a believer out of me you know, right. where because I was taught that this is not a real phenomenon. Patients just complain a lot. It's all in their head. The medication's already out of their system. And now, finally, just even in the past year, there's evidence that these medications are really, frankly, addictive. We were always taught never to use that word. These medications are not addictive. But they're habit-forming, and coming off them can be extremely difficult, if not sometimes impossible. So that's... And what it ends up for the... Um the makers of the pharmaceuticals that not only are they addictive but it from what I understand is the longer you're on them the more you need to increase the dosage is that correct yeah and that and that's you know sort of the, one of the definitions habituation one of the definitions of dependency so right. it's really not unlike any other so you know, like substance alcoholism of abuse. Just progressive. Yeah, exactly it's like any other substance abuse right. and, and and really the question that's raised is okay if, if depression is the number one cause of disability worldwide today, which it is, above everything else, then how is that compatible with the fact that we are prescribing to more people than ever before in history? You know, there are more people on these medications than ever before. Shouldn't right. those be inversely proportioned where you have less disability with more treatment? Right. So, you know... And let's go into the human condition there. I've written several books about being an abused child. Had a drug therapy been available to me when I was a teenager with a baby, with coming out of this abusive home, etc., uh, I, I, I certainly would not have had to feel the pain, the mm -hmm. emotional pain. Yes. But it was the emotional pain and the work I had to do to find myself in that and to realize this wasn't my fault and to come out on the other side has made me a person that I am today that I'm happy to be. What if I didn't have to go through that struggle because I'm looking at all these children on, on, on their medications thinking you're somewhere in the middle. You know, there's no highs, there's no lows. You sort of float through the middle and then you double up the night before your test because that makes you really clear, a lot of clarity and focus. and they're not experiencing emotional growth. Mm -hmm. You can never access wisdom if you don't along the way experience emotional growth and pain. So in your practice, it must be tricky to wean them off their medication while you're 
raising up the mineral and nutritional deficiencies and doing the emotional work in there that is going to kind of force them to feel the pain of their, mm -hmm. what life is, right? So this is why I love you because you ask these questions. This is <laughs> no, truly, no, people can't even bear to, to ask a question like that because there's so little tolerance in our culture in America for suffering. There is no room to fall right. apart. There is right. no, you know, it's, it's a bad thing to feel pain. And the truth right. is that every native culture to this world acknowledges that evolution and personal psycho-spiritual transformation is not always pretty and it doesn't always feel good, right? right? right. So we have um, bowed down you know, to, to the gods of capitalism because it's just about getting you back to work and keeping you functioning. That's right. really what, so the middle. yeah, right. just get rid of those symptoms. And, and right. you know, sort of what I'd like to reframe is that these symptoms are an invitation, right? It's an invitation to change something that is, is misaligned or that needs to be reconfigured within you. You can mm -hmm. say no to that invitation, but then what are you opting into? Just surviving, you right. know? Because the other alternative is, is an incredible path, as you are evidence of, exactly. And so, you know, when I meet with patients in my office, they have, they're concerned about their symptoms, right? They're not sleeping, they have brain fog, they've gained weight, their hair is falling out, they haven't pooped in two months, whatever it is. They're concerned about their symptoms. I'm interested in resolving those symptoms and I know with basic interventions on a nutritional level and, and detox that, that, that they'll be fine on that you know, front. But what I really wanna do is show them the door you know, to transformation. I want them to begin to think differently about pain and suffering so that they don't have this reflexive fear every time a challenge is presented to them. Part of that is feeling into your own power and feeling into your own intuition. So when you can change your physiology and your health through diet, what does that tell you? It tells you that it was in there all along. Right. You know, you didn't actually need anyone, including me, <laughs> to tell you right. that. So it gives you some agency back that you need to begin to think differently about how how you want to look at the landscape of your life. So, you know, in my practice, I have women who, you know, leave their husbands, they adopt babies, they move to Europe, they come out of the closet. You know, radical things start to happen in their lives as they, you know, move away from their medication experience. And it's because all that stuff needed to happen the whole time, right? It was a part of their, you know, dormant potential. So, yeah. There's a, a quote that I love from a book I read many years ago called The Road Less Traveled yes. by M. Heck. And the opening line is, um, it's the wise man who welcomes problems and mistakes because yes. through them we grow spiritually and emotionally. And that's pretty much what you and I are talking exactly. about. The, the pain is part of the journey and an essential part of the journey. And um, coming out on the other side of pain is like, uh, seeing the sunrise for the first time and you feel you own the little spot you occupy on the planet. Uh, I really admire the work that you're doing. I think you're so right on that it's not a Prozac deficiency, it's it's imbalance in the body and, the, and for a psychiatrist to be connecting the problems of depression uh, to what's going on in the rest of the body because it's not individual parts it's just a whole system mm -hmm. I think you're going to change uh, make a, a major impact in changing the way we access and use psychiatry which is such a valuable tool I was saved in uh, talk therapy myself so I um, appreciate what you're doing I see why Nick Gonzalez chose you <laughs> and he is um, to me um, one of the major medical minds like you said in the history of medicine and I look forward to you carrying on and I, I, I urge everybody who's interested in this subject to read Dr. Brogan's book it will grab you from the very first page and it's written in a way that um, light bulbs go off uh, Every, every page, you have to stop and make a note and think. It's a really good book, really good book. Bravo and congratulations and thank you. 
Thank you. It's such an impossibly meaningful endorsement, you know, coming coming from you. I'm I'm honored, you know, to be on the same page and to share a space with such a like mind. It really is incredible. Well, so thank it's, you. It's, 